In this video, we take a look at some more unanswered questions regarding the murder of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. Hello. Hello, please. Yeah, what's the problem, sir? Um, we've just drove down our farm track. Yeah. Go and uh, feed our pheasants. We've come across a range rover with three people in it. Yeah. Yeah, two years ago. They're dead. I don't know what's happening. Blood in the motor over them. Hello. And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. Now, my original plan for this video was for it to be quite a short video, a short discussion about Pat Tate's property, what was recovered from that property after he died, and a little bit of discussion regarding the pistol that was recovered by the police. But having looked at the information, having tied some of the ends together, having seen a new statement which I haven't seen before, you'll see a new theory starting to develop here, how all these parts of the puzzle can start to come together to give us a plausible theory as to why Tucker, Tate and Rolf were down the lane on the evening of December the 6th. First, let's start with a statement from a police officer who attends Pat Tate's property after he died. The following statement is from Colin Elsgood, dated the 9th of December, 1995. At around 1600 hours on Friday the 8th of December, 95, I was on duty when I attended 49 Gordon Road, Pitsy in order to conduct a weapon search. Prior to gaining entry to the bungalow, I was carrying out a cursory search of the rear garden when I saw a vent about six inches up an external chimney wall. Inside the vent, I saw a rolled up carrier bag blocking the hole. On touching it, I felt it contained something substantial and requested a scenes of crime officer to attend. Around 1620 hours, DC Hilton attended and after photographing the location, I removed the bag which I now felt contained a handgun. On opening the bag, I saw it was a silver double nine revolver that was loaded with nine rounds of ammunition. I can produce this firearm and ammunition as my exhibit reference CJE-1. I then handed possession of the firearm to DC Hilton. I remember Pat turning up with a friend in another car, basically with two great big holdalls, saying, can you just stick them in the other room, don't touch them, leave them there until I ring you and bring them with you. It must have been around two hours that I had to wait for him to ring me. It was a real long two hours. And then I had to get a cab and he was really insistent saying, don't let the cab driver hold these bags, you hold them, don't let him touch them. And they were heavy and I had to go over to Rayleigh and Essex and meet them at a party. And there were guns in there, really big guns. Fair play to Nipper, he came out and helped me. Okay, now what I find interesting about that interview is this apparent need for guns. We already have the Uzi submachine gun, which was borrowed or on let from Mad Mick Bowman. We also have the revolver, which was recovered from Pat Tate's property. And now we have the talk about these two holdalls, two very heavy holdalls with large guns in them being taken to a party in Rayleigh where Tucker and Tate were. It makes me wonder if they were actually at Workhouse Lane for a different purpose other than to purchase or sell drugs or to even scope out a potential airstrip. We then have the following statement dated the 12th of January 1996 from a Mrs. C.J. Evans Firearms Licensing HQ. Inquiry, Mr. Peter Webb. During the course of the telephone conversation with Mr. Peter Webb, he mentioned that he knew one of the people who was shot and killed in Rettendon recently. As I know that one of the persons killed was a Mr. Anthony Tucker, who had recently made an application for the grant of a firearm certificate. I assumed Mr. Webb was referring to him. I of course did not respond in any way to Mr. Webb regarding information, but feel that due to the possible drugs involvement and the interest previously shown regarding Mr. Webb's involvement with drugs, recently questioned at Heath Row, that I should record his comments for your information. Okay, so it would appear here that Tony Tucker, towards the end of 1995, according to this very short statement here, actually applied for a firearm certificate. 
So at this point, we have the Uzi submachine gun, which Craig Rolf picked up from Mick Bowman at the services. This was towards the back end of 1995. We then have the pistol, which was recovered from Tate's property. We've got now this talk of two holdalls with heavy guns being taken to a party where Tucker, Tate and Rolf were. And now we have this documentation which shows that Tucker was actually trying to legally obtain a firearm certificate. It's at this point now that the story takes a little bit of a bizarre twist, at least in the theoretical sense. Now what we have is the undisclosed telephone call between Bowman and Tucker, which occurred at 1707. Tucker is speaking to Bowman, a man who they have got this Uzi submachine gun from. They are found next to a shooting range. They don't intend to be out for very long because they have this meal booked at 8.30pm. Was this just a short trip down the lane to purchase a weapon, stash the weapon and then be off to the meal as planned? It's also worth mentioning that during his police interview, Michael Bowman did admit to being in the Range Rover. Not on the 6th of December, but in the weeks leading up to the deaths of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. It does make me wonder about this two o'clock phone call, which was to Timberlog Lane, the phone box at Timberlog Lane. This was supposedly the call to summon them there for the meeting that night or to arrange the meeting for later that evening. But this phone call was handled by Tony Tucker. A lot of people say, well, this phone box was right near Pat Tate's house. Yes, it was. But if you go through the statements, you will realise that around that time period, they were actually at a carpet shop with Tucker settling up an unpaid bill. This carpet shop, as I say, was located on Timberlog Lane, the very same road at which this phone box was located. So make no bones about it. It was Tony Tucker who handled that call at 2 p.m. If you believe this was the call to summon them there or to get them there that evening, it was most definitely Tony Tucker who took that call and arranged a meeting for later that night. So we have this interest in guns, we have the purchasing of guns, we have the moving around of different weapons, we have the submachine gun, we have Pat Tate's pistol, the guns in the hold all being taken to the party. We now have the undisclosed telephone call between Bowman and Tucker at nearly 10 past 5 in the evening, shortly before they are murdered. The very man, in fact, who they purchased or borrowed the Uzi submachine gun from just shortly before their deaths. Is there a link in the fact that they are found next to a shooting range? Is it the fact that they were just popping out briefly to simply purchase a shotgun? Is that why they don't have reams of money spilling out of their pockets? They had around a thousand pound between them. The reason I mention how much money Tucker Tate and Rolf were carrying that evening is because there, are, there is a rumour going around at the moment that they were driving around sourcing product for some kind of upcoming deal. Yet Tate left £6,000 in his property at his home, which was later recovered by the police, and they didn't have, as I say, a great deal of cash on them. Now, it may be the fact that there were never any guns to purchase at the shooting range. But could that be the lure to get Tucker, Tate and Rolf down the lane, particularly Tucker and Tate? Is that the reason that Mickey Bowman then went to prison in later years for firearms offences? Does this explain the 1707 telephone call between Tucker and Bowman? Does that explain the Uzi submachine gun, which was lent to Tucker, Tate and Rolf shortly before their murders? Was there a desire for weapons here? A need for weapons? Were they buying and selling them? What was the need for all of this weaponry? Not only do we have the undisclosed telephone call at 5.07pm, we also have two voicemails, which I'll play for you shortly, of Michael Bowman trying to reach Tucker and Tate on the day that they were killed. Interestingly, not only is Michael Bowman currently serving time for firearms offences, he actually served two years back in 1990 for offences concerning a shotgun. Before we get into the voicemails of Michael Bowman and his latter police interview, are we looking here at the lure for Tucker, Tate and Rolf? Is this how Tucker, Tate and Rolf ended up down Workhouse Lane? They were in frequent contact with someone they'd purchased a gun from previously, someone who had served time for shotgun offences. They are found next to a shooting range. 
Tony Tucker knew the brother of the farmer who discovered the bodies on December the 7th. Did Tucker know of White House Farm? Was he aware that they shot there on a Wednesday evening? Is that why they are found with just over a thousand pound in cash between them? And is that the reason that the restaurant booking still remained for 8.30 p.m. that evening? This was simply due to be a very short visit to purchase possibly a shotgun or some other type of weapon. And they simply didn't plan to be out for very long. Now if we take a look back at the restaurant booking, which was for December the 6th, 1995, the reservation time was 8.30 p.m. for Tucker and three other people. This reservation was increased shortly before 7 p.m. on December the 6th from four persons to six. A lot of people will say, who was this reservation for? What was the need to increase the booking size? Who were the other two people who were going to attend on the evening of December the 6th? Now, what I find quite interesting, having gone back over the Bowman Police interview, is that this man actually knew of the Global Netcalf himself. He had been there, in fact, with Tucker in the past. Firstly, let's take a look at the restaurant manager's statement regarding that booking. And then I'm going to play two very short clips from Bowman's police interview where he mentions having attended this restaurant in the past. The following statement is from Gary Jackets, dated the 8th of December 1995. I'm the operations manager of the Global CAF. The company title is First Continental. The Global CAF Romford is situated in South Street. The CAF has been open for about eight weeks. Since the CAF has been open, I've seen a man I know as Tony Tucker in the CAF about two or three times per week. I've known Tony on a casual basis for the last eight years. I've been associated with various entertainment establishments in Essex that Tony has frequented. Over the last 18 months, I've got to know him a little better. Tony was a very valuable customer and was never reluctant to spend money. He was always very polite to the staff who used to fight to serve him due to the tips he would give. He would always turn up for bookings, but if he couldn't make it, he would always let us know. He seemed to call mostly on a mobile phone, but was quite hard to get hold of if you needed to. I believe that Tony booked a table for four persons, phoning on Monday the 4th of December. I do not know who took the booking. Around 1300 hours the next day, I came into the CAF, and I was in a bit of a hurry and went past all the tables without seeing Tony. He came up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder and said hello. I apologised for not having seen him. He told me he had seen me the following night as he had a table booked for 8.30pm. His food was then served and he returned to the table and I could see he was in the company of a young girl, around 19 to 20 years old. She had long dark hair and I believe she was wearing a brown jumper. I did not see them again as I went about my business. For the whole period the cafe has been open, Tony has supplied the doorman on every night of the week. Tony deals direct with our head office, situated at 198 Victoria Road, Romford, Essex. He then pays the doorman. We always have the same doorman, Barry and Kevin. I do not know their surnames. We are linked by radio link to Hollywood's nightclub just around the corner in Atlanta Boulevard so we can get extra doorman quickly. Tony also runs the doorman at that nightclub. Sometimes, shortly before 7pm on Wednesday the 6th of December, I cannot be sure of the time, Tony phoned the CAF and stated that he wished to increase the booking from four persons to six persons for the 8.30 booking, and I told him that was not a problem. We said goodbye and I didn't hear from him again. During Wednesday evening I was busy at the restaurant. I was aware that Tony and his party had not turned up as booked and at 10.30pm we closed the restaurant. Hollywoods and the CAF are owned by the same company. When I spoke to Tony on Tuesday at the CAF and on the phone on Wednesday, he just seemed his normal chirpy self. Have you ever been out with Debbie and yourself and the others? Yeah, we went out with Tony on his birthday. This is the first time we ever went out together, Tony's birthday. Debbie was with me and the girls with us. We went out for something to eat. Um, there's an old fella, Colton, is it, I think? The security man or something? Do you remember where you went that evening? I oh, can't remember now. The Globe or something. That's what I'm saying to you. I'm, I'm lost over here. I really am. No, I meant you went to Tony's birthday party. Right, yeah. We get here. We went there. We went out, yeah. And you were with who? With my girlfriend, Debbie. Um, 
Carlton, Tony, uh, Pat, there was three other girls there. <sighs> Can't think of all their names and that. Um, we went out and had something to eat in the Globe. Was Craig with you? Craig was there, I think, yeah, and his girl. Now, considering we have the undisclosed telephone call at 5.07pm between Bowman and Tucker, we now have Bowman admitting he'd been there at least on one occasion with Tucker and others to the Global Net CAF. I guess most of you are at least considering at this point that Bowman may have been one of these extra guests. But do remember, we're looking at two extra people, not just one. Now, where this gets a little bit more peculiar is when we take a look back at Donna Jagger's statement. Now, regarding the Uzi submachine gun, which was collected from the services by Craig Rolf, we're not just talking about an exchange between Bowman and Rolf here. There's also a mystery third vehicle, a dark green, I believe, Vauxhall Cavalier, which had another occupant in it. So Bowman did not travel alone to that meeting with Rolf regarding the submachine gun. He was with another party. Let's take a look back at Donna Jagger's statement. The following paragraphs are from a statement given by Donna Jaggers on the 8th of the 2nd, 1996. I was aware that Craig's associates were Tony Tucker and Patrick Tate. During the mid to the end of November 95, I was aware that they had something going on which at this time I am not willing to discuss. Craig told me that he was going to pick up a machine gun with a silencer and ammunition for their business. He told me that it was coming from a man I know as Mad Mick, who comes from London. I do know that this person is Mick Bowman. I asked Craig how much the gun was going to cost, and he told me that it was being borrowed and was going back to Bowman. About a week after Tony's birthday, which was the 17th of November, I went with Craig and others, who I do not want to name, to Hollywood's nightclub in Romford. Bowman was supposed to have met us in the Global Netcalf beforehand, but he didn't turn up. I then met him through Craig in the nightclub. I recall thinking that he wasn't what I had expected. Craig had told me stories about him. He was with a girl who I only know as Debbie. About a week after this, I can be no more precise than this, Craig told me that we were going to meet Mick at the Furrock Services to collect the gun. I went with Craig in the blue Range Rover, F424 NPE, to the services and had something to eat in the Granada premises. I knew that we were supposed to meet Bowman around 1pm, but he was about 10 minutes late. Craig went outside and returned shortly and told me I was to go outside with them. When I got outside, I saw that Bowman was there with a white VW Corrado car and there was another male in an old green Vauxhall Cavalier. Bowman was acting very paranoid, and I took it that he was on cocaine and was acting hyper because of the situation with the gun. I am aware of how people behave when they have taken cocaine, and that is how Bowman appeared to me. Bowman was trying to organise how they should drive off to a different location. Craig then suggested we should lead. The Cavalier should go in the middle, and then Bowman at the end. This only took a matter of minutes. Craig and I then got into the Range Rover and drove onto the A13 and travelled along to the Five Bells roundabout. We then came all the way around the Five Bells roundabout and Craig pulled up onto the Eastern Garages parking area. The Cavalier parked behind us and Bowman parked the Corrado behind that. We all got out and I started to walk away to stay out of the way. I saw a blue-grey holdall come out of the boot of the Cavalier and go into the boot of the Range Rover. The driver of the Cavalier was a small man, around 5 foot 6 inches tall, early 20s or early 30s, of thin build. He had short cropped hair and wore glasses. I did not hear him speak. I am unable to say who took the hold out of the Cavalier, but I believe Craig would probably have put it in the Range Rover because he was impatient like that. Craig called me back to the car and I got into the front of the Range Rover. I recall Bowman got into the back of the car and told Craig that he wanted the Range Rover once he had finished with it. Bowman then got out of the car and Craig and I drove off and went to Patrick Tate's bungalow in Gordon Road, Basildon. Craig had told me that Tate had spoken with the garage proprietor at Eastern Garages, a man called Barry Dorman, and told him that he had to buy Bowman's Corrado. I was aware that Bowman was going to stay behind at the garage and speak to Dorman about this. I recall seeing the two men walking towards one another when I was in the Range Rover. When we arrived outside Pat's house, Pat and Tony Tucker were sitting in Anna Whitehead's, Tucker's girlfriend's, Suzuki Vitara. I cannot remember if Craig had spoken to them on his mobile phone prior to arriving at the house. 
Tony and Pat got out of the Vatara, and Craig took the holder and the gun from the boot, and all three went into the house. Sarah Saunders was at this time moving her stuff out of the house with the help of two friends. I didn't want to get involved in what was potentially a difficult situation, so I stayed in the car. Craig was in the house for around 10 to 15 minutes, and then returned to the car with the holdall and the gun. He put the items back in the boot and then drove to 108 Mill Green where the gun and holdall were put into the loft. On the way from Gordon Road, Craig was saying how pleased they were with it and how much damage it could cause. I did not see the gun at this time. A couple of days later, Craig picked me up from work and told me that Tony, Pat and him had tested the gun. He stated that it was tested over at Tony's fobbing address in the field. He told me that he had cleaned it all and that he had put it back in the loft. He told me that he had cleaned his fingerprints off the gun as I was concerned about this. The next thing that happened was that Craig, Tony and Pat were found shot dead. I had a lot of things on my mind, but I realised the machine gun was a problem, but I knew that the police didn't know about the Mill Green address and I thought it would be safe to leave it here. Now what I find quite interesting regarding Donna Jagger's statements, or at least one of the points which I find quite interesting, is the mention here of Michael Bowman or Mick Bowman trying to get Craig Rolfe to drive off elsewhere in order to complete the deal. Now this is something that I have surmised in a previous video, that the only way that I can see Tucker Tate and Rolfe ending up down that lane unarmed is if they were somehow lured to somewhere that they would deem as public, maybe a pub car park or somewhere that they knew well, they met someone that they trusted, and then they were ushered off to another location. It appears here that this is what has happened on this occasion regarding the handover of the gun. We have, in Donna Jagger's words, Mick Bowman acting quite paranoid, quite shifty, sort of keen to get Craig to drive elsewhere in order to complete the deal. Another point worthy of discussion is how this deal at the Forex Services concerning the submachine gun how that deal actually took place. We have Donna Jaggers and Craig Rolfe in the Range Rover. We have an unknown male driving a green Vauxhall Cavalier. And then we have the third vehicle containing Michael Bowman driving his white VW. These three vehicles set off in convoy towards the Five Bells roundabout where they eventually reach Eastern Garages where the deal is finalized. Is this what is being described on the evening of their deaths? on the evening of December the 6th, 1995, in Rebecca Carr's statement, where she discusses a Range Rover, a car in front of that Range Rover, and a white vehicle, which the Range Rover appears to be following. The following statement is from Rebecca Carr, dated the 9th of December, 1995. I'm employed by the governors of a grant-maintained school as the head of department. At around 17.25 hours on the 6th of December 95, I was driving my red Vauxhall Astra car from Canvey Island to Malden. I was at the lights on red at the Retterton Turnpike and I'd moved on to the roundabout from the A130 from the general direction of Rayleigh. I was in the near side lane of three cars, re I was the third from pole position at the lights. In the centre lane to my offside, I noticed at pole position a white Sierra saloon car which I believe was a C registration. Behind the Sierra was another vehicle that I do not recall, and behind that was a dark coloured Range Rover. The Range Rover was slightly ahead of me to my off side. I could see two heavily built men in the front of this vehicle, and a third sitting in the middle of the rear seat, who was leaning to one side and gave me the impression he was looking at the vehicles ahead. The man in the rear was large build, and I could see that he had his hair cut short at the rear, with clippers maybe, but longer on top. This man had dark hair and wore a dark jacket. One of the men in the front had lighter coloured hair, like a very light brown. I also noticed the passenger and driver of the Sierra were very big built and stocky, as I could see no light between them. They seemed to fill the front of the Sierra. The passenger had his left arm resting on the door at the bottom of the passenger side window. He looked a very smart man in appearance, he gave the appearance of having money. He was wearing a smart expensive looking French coat with epaulettes, and this was a bluey greeny colour with an almost silky appearance. There may have been somebody else in the rear of the Sierra, but I'm not sure about this. 
As the lights changed to green, the Sierra moved off at speed straight up the A130. The vehicle at pole position in my lane turned left to Wickford. The vehicle in the offside lane between the Sierra and Range Rover turned right towards South Woodham. It was immediately obvious that the Range Rover was trying to keep up with the Sierra, as that too went straight onto the A130 ahead. This section of the A130 is on a hill, two lanes quickly merging into one. There is a large arrow on the road indicating for the offside lane to merge with the near side. The Range Rover was struggling to keep up with the Sierra that was by now some distance in front, and I slowed to let the Range Rover in front of me. We move through the village, the Sierra moving fast exceeding the speed limit which I believe is 40 miles per hour. Then there was another car, then the Range Rover, then me. As we moved down the hill I could see that the Sierra braked very very hard which caused the unknown vehicle the Range Rover and me to brake hard. Even though the Sierra had some good ground on us I was concerned that the road could be icy. The Sierra had its offside indicator working and it was waiting to turn into the car park of White House Farm, and as soon as the Range Rover saw this, he put his indicator on also. The oncoming traffic was heavy and slow moving, and the traffic allowed the Sierra and Range Rover to turn into the car park. I remember seeing a bluey pickup transit sized truck that had ladders stacked over the cab. I cannot remember if this is the vehicle actually let them across or was behind the vehicle that did. The car park is part of the farm shop, there is a round silo bin there. I looked to my right and could see the Sierra turning in a wide circle back towards the exit and the Range Rover was turning the same way, but in a tighter circle towards the exit. I then moved away in the flow of traffic. At the time I observed these things it was dark, the visibility was good and I would describe the weather as a crisp dry winter's evening. The Rettendon Turnpike roundabout is illuminated during the hours of darkness. I did not see the faces of the occupants of the Sierra and I only had a partial view of the occupants of the Range Rover. Now just to make things a little bit more confusing, in Rebecca Carr's statement she mentions that the car that is second in line, i.e. you have the Range Rover, the next car, then the white car, that second vehicle actually turns off. But then once they're reaching White House Farm there appears to be a car again in front of the Range Rover before the white vehicle. Those two vehicles appear to turn into White House Farm potentially because they have missed the turn off for the lane. The picture I get in my mind when reading Rebecca Carr's statement is the fact that the indicators come on very late, they turn into White House Farm, they do a large circle and a small circle back towards the exit almost as if they've turned their indicators on late, they've missed the lane, they've turned into the car park, they've done a big loop straight back to the exit to turn left then to go back towards the lane in question. It's really what's playing out in my mind as I'm picturing what I'm reading in front of me there with Rebecca Carr's statements. They've overshot the lane, the indicators come on late, the Range Rover's indicators come on after the white vehicle. It's almost as if they're following this white vehicle down there, that white vehicle has overshot the lane, they've turned into White House Farm, done a big loop back to the exit to turn left and then head down the lane in question. Now in Mick Bowman's police interview, I believe the interviewing officers touch upon Rebecca Carr's statement in an ever so subtle manner. If you remember Rebecca Carr's statement, which we've just gone over, she talks about the Sierra heading off at speed, the white vehicle heading off at speed, the Range Rover trying to keep up. Take a listen in to Mick Bowman's police interview here. Now this is me narrating what has been written. This is a narration of his transcript from his police interview. But listen to what the police say to him here. It's like a little car front by the roundabout, opposite on the opposite side. Okay, so you travel there and who leads the way? Craig led the way. What sort of speed were you doing? I don't know. Was it a fast drive down there or a slow drive or... Well, I really don't know. I didn't tear down there. No? One last drive in the Carrada? No, no, it wasn't anything like that. You know, I've got the car there. I don't know what time it was. He didn't give me the check straight away. And then we take a look at the police interview of Sarah Saunders. Sarah Saunders being the ex-partner of Pat Tate, one of the three individuals who was killed, it's during her police interview that she claims that she was told that they were going to meet up with Mad Mick Bowman on the night they died. 
DC Norton states, Are you aware that Donna Jaggers has made statements to us? Hmm, I've heard that she's been helping with inquiries, yeah. And did you know what the substance of her statement is? Not a clue, no. I mean, she says that they were going to meet Mickey Steele that night. Hmm, yeah, I've heard that. Hmm, I've also heard that, well, I can't think where I heard it, but... I heard that she said they were going to meet Mad Mickey or something first of all, that you've arrested him on gun charges or something. I think what both confuses and concerns me regarding the investigation into the deaths of Tucker, Tate and Rolf is just how little questioning Michael Bowman actually receives. A lot of these very important questions are never put to Michael Bowman. The fact that he had knowledge of the global net calf, the fact that the restaurant booking from Tony Tucker was increased from four to six persons, the fact that there's an undisclosed telephone call that the police would have known about between Bowman and Tucker at 5.07pm on the evening of December the 6th. What is equally bizarre is the fact that Michael Bowman isn't even quizzed by the police during his interview with the fact that he is supposed to be the very man who is due to cut up the coke from this incoming deal. He is quizzed about the, the weapon, the Uzi submachine gun. He's questioned about his whereabouts very briefly. But they never touch upon the fact that he is supposed to be the very man who is involved in cutting up this incoming consignment. What I'm going to play for you now are a couple of paragraphs from Donna Jagger's statement which mentions this fact. Then we're going to take a quick listen to the voicemails between Bowman, Tucker and Tate on December the 6th, 1995 followed by Michael Bowman's police interview. The following are paragraphs from Donna Jagger's statement, dated the 14th of the 3rd, 1996. Tate and Tucker were going to use the gun on the man from the firm in order to take the Charlie. I knew they'd made sure the gun worked, but I did not know how far they were planning to go when they robbed the firm. Steele was going to land the plane, and Tate and Tucker were going to take the complete load. It was going to be split eventually 10 kilos each and was going to be taken to John McCarthy. They had told Craig they intended to rip steel off by cutting 3 kilos of the coke into 10 kilos of impure. This would have resulted in Tate and Tucker having 27 kilos between them. The remaining 3 kilos was going to be taken to Mick Bowman and he was going to cut it for them. I do not know what the arrangements were to get the 3 kilos to Bowman or to get the 10 kilos of impure back to steel. But by this time I was getting very worried by Craig's involvement and told him that I didn't want him to have any part in it. A light down, get the ring mate, it's me Craig. A light down, get the ring mate, Mickey. A light down, get the ring mate, it's me Craig. Can you give me a ring, mate, on um, 0973-396-781? Cheers, mate. The following is a narration of transcripts from a police interview conducted on the 15th of the 2nd, 1996. The person in question who is being interviewed is Michael Bowman. This interview is being tape recorded. The time is now 11.09am on Thursday, the 15th of February, 1996. And we are at the interview room at Chelmsford Police Station in Essex. We are investigating the offence of unlawful possession of a prohibited weapon. A record of this interview will be made and may be given in evidence if you are brought to trial. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. I am Philip Bridge. I'm a detective constable with the Essex Police and also present in the room is... I'm Detective Constable 744 Michael Brown, also stationed at Police Headquarters. Mr. Bowman, if you could introduce yourself with your name, please. I am Michael Scott Bowman. Right, first of all, Mr. Bowman, when you were brought back from your home address this morning by a uniformed officer from Essex, which is PC 425 Montgomery, and this is quoted as you said it to him, you've been expecting this for the past few weeks. I was in the motor about three, no, two weeks before they were ironed out. I went out for a drink with them. Now I understand that you've had the opportunity to see that note in the officer's pocketbook and sign it, which you've refused to do, is that correct? No, I've not seen the note at all. I haven't read them. Right, were you not offered that note? Well, he did offer me a note, yeah, but I mean... Right, so you've obviously confirmed that you were given them to look at. 
Well, I didn't read them, no. But you either didn't or didn't want to sign them. No, I didn't. Would you care to be given the opportunity again to see that note? Not at this stage, no. Um, I'm not prepared to sign anything or talk about or discuss that at the moment. I want to know why I'm here before we go any further. Right, okay. So if you let me know why I'm here, then I'll let you know if I want to sit here and talk to you and listen to it. Right. Well, Phil's already said, hasn't he, Mr Bowman, what you've been arrested for. The other part that we just want to put to you before we get into the, the full nuts and bolts of why you're here is that when you actually arrived at Chelmsford Police Station, that you were seen by the custody sergeant, and he's got, well, I should say, I've got a copy of your custody record here under reference 454 of 96. And I'm reading from it when it's got the suspect's volunteered comment on detention, and you have been recorded as saying, quote, If this is about the Rettenden business, I was expecting a visit anyway. I was in the car about a week before. Would you like to confirm that as well? Yeah. I would. Uh, I can confirm that. Fine. Okay, that's lovely. It's only just to get what was said recorded down, then we can just check the accuracy with you, if that's okay. Going back to what you were asking us, right, and bringing it up to date on the Thursday, the 7th of December 1995, last year, the bodies of three men were found in a Range Rover, which has got an index number of F424NPE, and this was found at Retton's in Essex. And they'd been shot to death and the identities of the deceased were later established as Craig Rolfe, Tony Tucker and Patrick Tate. Mm -hmm. Now the Essex police launched a murder inquiry into their deaths and during the course of the inquiry it came to light that you knew the deceased. Yeah, that's right. I know of them. Yeah? Yeah. How do you know them? I know I'm from prison. I know Pat from prison. And I uh, went and had a drink when he got released. A little while ago. But I mean... I don't sort of associate with them. I know them. But I mean, it's not illegal to have friends, is it? No, certainly not. No. I mean, you know, I mean, if this is what I'm thinking it's about, like I said earlier, the reason why I thought that maybe I'd get a tug is because I was in the car about a week or so before it happened. I went to a club of them in South End somewhere. Club Art, I think it was. Club Art? Yeah, something like that. I don't know. I had a couple of drinks at a couple of places with them. But that was it. I mean, I haven't seen them. Well, I was not anywhere near that place, mate, when it happened. I certainly wouldn't have been involved in their deaths because, I mean, you know, I wasn't against them. If we could just deal with your knowledge of the people to start with, you're saying Pat Tate. Yeah, I knew Pat more than any others, really. Tony was all right as well. Didn't really know Craig. I mean, I sort of knew him. I wouldn't say I was close to them, close buddies and that, but I knew them. I sort of, you know, associated once or twice with them. Went out and had a drink with them once or twice. And what about Tony? How many times have you met Tony? At boxing. I used to see him at boxing quite a bit. With, um, you know, Nigel Ben from, you know, when he was at Tenerife and that. I used to go to Tenerife quite a lot and train. I knew Tony through that, really. I mean, out of the three of them, I would say that I knew Pat more. And I knew Tony was all right. But I didn't really know Craig that well. How many times have you met Craig? Dunno, probably two or three times, I think. Top whack. Do you remember under what circumstances? No, not really, no. I mean, I'd been out drinking and seen him, you know. When Pat got out, he had a little drink, had a little party when he first got out. He'd been out a little while, hadn't he? And did you go to that then, Mr Bowman? Well, I went over and had a drink with him, yeah. I mean, I went out and had a drink with him. Do you remember where that was? I couldn't tell you. Um, I'm no good in Essex at all. I'm liable to get lost. Not even the name of the town. Um, no, somewhere Basildon way. Oh, so you knew it was Basildon? Yeah, like, sort of that way, yeah, but I couldn't tell you where it was in that. And could you elaborate as to what was spoken about in the car earlier? Well, I, well, what I said to you, what I said earlier in the car was that I thought that when it was Essex Police, that it had something to do with this, because I thought that, you know, I've got form for firearms, I've done three years for the shotgun, and I'm, you know, I ain't fucking very nice. I thought that maybe, yeah, this is why I'm going to get a tug down. Now, look, I've been in the car. They've got to rule me out. And obviously, it's gone out of my head a little bit because I thought it would have been done a lot quicker than that. But, I mean, you know, you've been in the Range Rover. I've been in the Range Rover, yeah. I think twice I went in the Range Rover, yeah. I sold my car. What sort of car was that? I had a Volkswagen, yeah. Or my girlfriend had a Volkswagen Carada. And I sold it to a car front on the A13, which is the same car front they bought a the car from, I think. Because I saw the Range Rover there, and they told me they were going to buy it. 
I said I wanted to sell the car and he said sell it to that fella. So would you just like to expand a bit? I know you said that you've been in the Range Rover twice. How has that come about? Well, I've been, or I met, or I went over there and met them, I think. I met them at a roundabout because I started to get lost. And I went out for a drink with them. You know, got in the car, the Range Rover with them. We went out. Went to, I don't know, I think it was Raquel's or somewhere like that. Went and had a drink. And who was in the Range Rover at that time? There was me, um, Tony, Pat, a couple of girls. I mean... We was all crammed in it. Um, I think Craig was there as well. There's a couple of birds, um, their, their girlfriends that, that was with them. And we went out to a club in Basildon somewhere and then we went somewhere else. I mean, I was drinking, I can't remember all the names of places, but I think that was about a week before it happened. Right, and how did you get to hear about the party? Uh, Pat rang me up, um, I believe. Pat phoned you. Well, Pat would have phoned me or Tone. They both had my girlfriend's mobile phone number. So if you've gone through the phone bills, you'd know that they were ringing me from their house phones. So that's why I said I presumed I was going to get a pull down here somehow. So you spoke to them via your girlfriend's mobile phone. Well, yeah, that's how they used to get hold of me, really. Right. And did you have a phone number to get in contact with them? No, no, no. Um, that was the only number. As I say, I live with my girlfriend. So you didn't have a mobile number for any of the three of them? No. Oh, I've got Pat's number. You've got Pat's. And I've got um, his house number as well. I think I've got Tony's number, his mobile. Right. I might have rung him once or twice as well. Have you been to their houses? I've been to Tony's house and I've been to Pat's house. Where was Tony living when you visited him? Um, big place. Can't think of what it's called. Just by the car front where the car was sold. Would that be fobbing? Fobbing, that's it. Yeah. Um... That's where if I'd ever met them, I'd, I'd go there, yeah. I mean, I've probably come over this side and met them probably four or five times. I've come over this end and Pat hasn't been out that long, I don't think, has he? Um, he hasn't been out that long. But I mean, I sold my car because I wanted to get rid of the car. And then we had the stuff with Tony's. Um, that was another time. He said to come over, go and see the fella at the car front and see if you can sell it to him. So did you arrange that on the day that you were going to try and sell the car? What were the arrangements with the people, you know, when you were coming down to Essex then? Well, he just said, come over. He said he knows the fella. Um, he said, just take the car there. And who was the conversation with? Tony. Tony. With Tony? Yeah, I mean, you know. And who did you deal with at the car sales? Oh, I can't remember the fella's name. I really can't. Um, was he a mate of Tony's then? They knew him, yeah. Um, I, I mean, you know, I didn't really have a good deal or anything. I just wanted to get rid of it for Deb, you know. We've got a little estate now with a dog. And how much did you get for the car? Oh, I can't remember now. I think it was probably about seven grand. And who's, uh, who's Deb? Deb. Deb's my girlfriend. That's your girlfriend, right? My girlfriend, yeah. Have you ever been out with Debbie and yourself and the others? Yeah, we went out with Tony on his birthday. This is the first time we ever went out together, Tony's birthday. Debbie was with me and the girls with us. We went out for something to eat. Um, there's an old fella, Carlton, is it, I think? The security man or something? Do you remember where you went that evening? I can't remember now. The Globe or something. That's what I'm saying to you. I'm, I'm lost over here. I really am. Tell us um, what birthday is this? This is, um, I don't know, late last year, I suppose. I don't know, a month or two, two months before this happened. And this was Tony's? Oh, yeah, it's Tony's birthday, yeah. And was that the first time that you went with them? That was the first time I'd been out drinking with them because I knew them through my co-defendant, Fisher. Fisher actually introduced me to Tone. I'm sorry, I don't know anything about that. Well, I'm nicked last year over here with two kilos of amphetamine, as you know, don't you? You must know that. Well, we don't at the moment, Mr. Bowman, no. But so you obviously know if you want to talk about that. Well, I'm telling you, yeah. Well, you know, there's no bollocks here. I mean, is there? I mean, you know, like, I'm here. I mean, I'm telling you what I know. You know, like, I ain't got anything to do with this fucking turnout. I ain't like, you know, it ain't me. I know them. I ain't going to do shit like this, mate. I mean, you know, I've had enough of all of it. Fisher and myself, well, I've got in a car of him and he wound up, well, he didn't tell me that something's in the car. And we got nicked for some amphetamine. There's two kilos in the panel of the door. So we wound up going to court. He's put his hands up to it. He said, you know, you told the police exactly what's gone on. 
I never knew it was in the car and I was found not guilty by a jury at Chelmsford. This was last year, August, I think it was. That's how I knew. He introduced me to him a while back, about eight months ago. Okay, so he's introduced you. Well, he introduced me to Pat and Tony, yeah. Um, well, Tony more than anything, more than Pat. I mean, I've seen Pat once or twice in prison. And what's the purpose of the introduction? Nothing. I mean, you know, just I just know him. All right. Yeah. So you were saying so... Well, look, look, one way or another, all I was saying earlier was, uh, I mean, I want to know what I was coming here for, you know. No, I meant you went to Tony's birthday party. Right, yeah, we get here, we went there, we went out, yeah. And you were with who? With my girlfriend, Debbie. Um, Carlton, Tony, uh, Pat, there was three other girls there. Oh, can't think of all their names and that. Um, we went out and had something to eat in the Globe. Was Craig with you? Craig was there, I think, yeah, and his girl. I can't think of, um, well, unless you know his date of birth, that's what it was. Okay, so you saw them then, how many times after, at Tony's? Well, yeah, well, I think I crashed at Pat's house one night as well. Um, we were drunk then, um, me and Debbie, we had a drink, you know. I can't think of what night that was. Can you remember the address? We sent flowers there as well, that's um, Pat's little actual bungalow, the one where he had all that ag before. Um, well, yeah, I can't remember. Well, he has got a bungalow, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He was shot there before, wasn't he? That's right, yeah, yeah. That's the place, because I didn't like staying there. I didn't like fucking staying there, to be honest with you. I thought, cool, I'm only going to have a drink sitting in there like that. You know what I mean? Ain't exactly angels that lot. I mean, I didn't really... I mean, you know, you don't realise some of these things going on. And some things that I heard that have been going on really in Basildon with that fucking lot, I mean, you know... It weren't up my street, really. You know, I've got to tell you. What did you hear then, Mr Bowman? Well, I mean, you know, as I say, some of the things I've heard, I mean, I don't want to go into that, but they weren't good people. Nice people, really. I mean, what's happened to them, mate? It fucking frightened the life out of me. I don't want to know, mate. I don't want to know none of it no more. So what was your reaction when you heard they'd been murdered? <laughs> Shock, mate. Frightened the life out of me. Because he said he was going to give me a ring. He said, we'll go for a drink or something just before Christmas. Then all of a sudden, bang, he's gone. Heard it on the radio, I think. I thought, three fellas in a Range Rover? I was in that Range Rover and I thought, that ain't right. Frightened the life out of me. So you've been in the Range Rover? Well, that's what I thought. I thought, I've been in that car when I've been having a drink. I might have been fucking flopped on myself. Frighten the fucking life out of me. I mean, what do you do? So how many times have you actually been in that Range Rover? I think I've been in it once or twice. And were you sitting in the Range Rover? I can't remember. Have you ever driven it? No, no, never drove it. Have you been in the front passenger seat? Well, I think so, yeah. I might have been squeezed into the back as well at some point. Just as a matter of formality, I'd appreciate if you could give us some help on this one. Patrick, Pat, Tony and Craig were murdered on the evening of the 6th of December, which was a Wednesday evening. I appreciate it was some time ago, but can you tell me where you were on that particular time? Um, I'm not sure. Debbie will know. Um, I can't remember. I really can't. Do you keep a diary or anything like that? No. Debbie would remember, though, because I think I went... Oh, did I? Was I with my mum and dad? Her mum and dad? Her mum and dad come down? I'm not sure. Oh, I'm not sure. I think I had dinner with her mum and dad. I'm, I'm not sure that night. I remember that night I was at home. I think they'd come down to see me and I had Charlie. I had my daughter on the sick that day because I was spooked, you know. It spooked me a little bit and I think I kept her on Wednesday. Well, most Wednesdays. I want to just say to you that the bodies were found on the 7th. On Thursday the 7th. Yeah. Okay, in the morning. So what we're interested really is about the night before that. Right. I really can't remember at this stage. I, I can remember the day, I think, when I, well, I think like me, my daughter, my baby come over, I collected her about four. I can't remember that day. Well, obviously, if as you were saying, that you were obviously spooked when you heard the news that day, mm -hmm. that uh, does not give you an inkling that you were, uh, you think, call oh, blimey, I've been with them that night, you know, I've been out with them, and like you give a bit of a, a clue as to what you were doing. Well, I wasn't out drinking the night before. No, that's not what I'm saying. But when you said you could have been out with them, well, what I'm saying is if I was in the car and I went out and actually had a drink with them, then I was in that car. 
that they were assassinated in. It ain't hard to work out. It's frightening, isn't it, really? I mean, fuck me, I've got form in that, and I ain't no cunt, but I ain't, you know, like... I'm not going to be going out somewhere drinking and being roped into something like that with those lot, because I know them. Well, can I just run over a couple of things about your own car that you were saying? Um, at the moment, you're running what sort of car? We've got a little S. Um, I can't drive. I'm on a ban. Oh, okay. Well, I'm on a ban at the moment. My girlfriend's got a little Escort estate we've bought, you know, because we've got a dog now, you see. And when did you get rid of your VW Carrada? Uh, um, well, she'll know all the details, the dates and that, Debbie. Um, my girlfriend, she'll know all the dates. If you want to get specific, I'll find out. But I think it was about a week or two weeks before this, this awful business happened. Okay, and when you sold the car, yeah, um, well, he gave me a check. Did he? Yeah. What, dated? Dated, yeah, he, he dated it and gave it to Debbie. Um, it's written Debbie Ferguson's name, so that's about all confirmed. So how did you go about selling the car? Well, I said to Tone, does he know anyone for it? And he said, yeah, maybe, that he would buy it. So what did you do? Well, me and Debs, we'd drive it over there and he said he'd buy it and wrote out a check. It's lovely and we got something a bit cheaper. Because it's a bit too dear to run, plus I was on a band, so... If you took the car over there, then how did you get back home? Oh, I can't remember. I think I got a lift, um, I think, and he gave me a lift back, one of them. Who's that? Oh, I can't remember, hold on. Yeah, um, I, think, I think I got a lift back. I think Tone dropped me back. In what car? It's, uh, it would have been a Porsche, um, 923 Porsche. Um, got a black Porsche, it's a black Porsche, yeah, we used a Porsche. It was a while back. Can we move on a bit further now to basically for the reasons why you are here, shall we say? Right. We've obviously spoken to a lot of people, made a lot of inquiries, as you can imagine, in a murder, a triple murder. Right. And various things have come to light. And the one that comes to light that affects you is that you were requested to supply a firearm to the three of them. I was requested. Nah, that's wrong. No way. Who said this then? Bear with me, you were requested to supply an automatic pistol, silencer and ammunition. No, not me. No way. No way. And they were going to use it for their own purpose, which obviously was a unlawful purpose. Look, there's no way that I was involved in it. These people, you know, no way. No way at all. As I've said to you, I've been over there a couple of times, had a couple of drinks with them, crashed at Pat's house once, landed me some clothes and bits and pieces. I ain't been doing no business with these people at all. Not on that side of things. I'm dead certain of that. I mean, I live in Kent. I ain't nowhere near this lot. You say you live in Kent, but it's Bromley, Kent you live, isn't it? Yeah. Which is not a million miles away from Basildon, is it? Yeah, but I mean, like, at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say to you is I don't do no business like this shit with these people. I don't do it. I mean, I may have gone out of them a couple of times, had a drink with them and that, but it shocked the life out of me that this has happened. It's really livened me up, Governor, believe me. This has frightened the fucking life out of me. I certainly ain't involved in supplying firearms to them. I don't supply firearms to anyone. I don't fucking do it. I'm out of all that. Because I've got form for firearms and that, it's not nice to be roped into things like this. I mean, I've been nowhere near it. Nothing like that. If I can tell you that it's not because of any previous convictions that you've been arrested for this, for this matter, it does go a little bit deeper than that. And that is that on the date between the middle of November and the date that they got murdered, it suggested that you actually supplied the firearms of Craig Rolfe. We also believe that you met him at a service station. No. No way. Have you ever been to the Granada Motorway Services at Farrock? Mm. Off the M25? Yeah. And when did you go there? Oh, I can't remember. Well, it's important that you try and remember. I mean, I can't remember. I think I've met um along them services, one of them services. I think it's the fobbing one, though, when I've met him. I haven't met Craig. I met Tony. What we're putting to you is that you had a meeting with other people as well at those services, and there you had a firearm. I had a firearm that was intended for Rolf, Tucker and Tate. It's intended for them as in to loan to them. No way. No. It's not like that at all. It's just like I said to you, I'm prepared to sit here without my slizzard and tell you exactly what I know. I don't know nothing about what they've been doing. I haven't been involved with them at all in that way. I know nothing like that. But I thought that maybe I was going to get pulled in, you know, for one reason or another, because of my form. And I know I've been in the car. 
So I thought maybe that, yeah. Just go back to this one supplying of the firearm. The allegation is that you met them at the Forex services and you travelled to the Eastern garages, the Five Bells garages where you sold the car. Yeah, yeah. And there the firearm was transferred from a vehicle into the Range Rover. No, no, no way, no, no way. So why should statements be made at all? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why they're trying to work me into this. I don't know. Why? Have you upset somebody? Not that I know of. Not, not from any of that lot. I don't know. No. Is there anybody in that group who you've had a run-in with? Not really, no. Like I said, I don't really know them that well. I mean, not to stick it on me that way. I mean, I don't know. I really don't know. And the firearm that you are alleged to have supplied was then taken to Pat Tate's bungalow, the one that you've been to. Hmm. Yeah, I said I've been to the bungalow. And there it was examined. No. When you said earlier on, Mr Bowman, that uh, when you dropped your Corrada off at the garage, you obviously had a deal. You talk about selling the car and you've got the cheque that's gone through Debbie's account. And obviously we can check that later on. And you seem to recall that you got a lift back in the black Porsche. Hmm. What we're saying is that at that time you had the meeting at the services. On that day with that car, I had a machine gun with me at the Granada services. That's what you're saying. Yes, at that day there was you in your Corrada, there was another person in another vehicle and them in the Range Rover. And you then went down, all three of you. So you're saying to me that I've gone down there to sell my car with her and I've taken a machine gun over there with me and sold it to them, is that right? I want to stop this interview right now until my solicitor gets here because I mean this ain't on now. I've come down here, I mean, you've dragged me out of my bed, in my dressing gown. No, you just hold on a minute. Can I just finish please? I've told you exactly what I know. I've done no business with these people. I've asked them to sell a car for me and he said that the fellow would buy it. So to come on over. I've gone over there, had a couple of drinks with them, but I certainly, definitely did not sell them a machine gun. I'm not involved with these people in that way and I'd rather talk to my solicitor now and get some advice and stop the interview. Okay, Mr. Bowman, as I said at the start, you are quite entitled and arrangements will be made. So the time now is 11.35. We're going to stop the interview so you can seek legal advice, okay? Thank you. Okay. But just before we do stop it, this isn't evidential, Mr. Bowman, but what I'd like to do is give you a copy of this form, which is the A405, which explains your notice of how to get hold of the tape. Okay, so I'm going to give that to you now and you can read that at your leisure. Okay, thanks. Okay. The interview is now being terminated. This interview is being tape recorded. The time is 16.11. That's 11 minutes past four in the afternoon on Thursday the 16th of February 1996. And we are in the interview room at Chelmsford Police Station. We are investigating the offence of unlawful possession of a prohibitive weapon, which is contrary to the Firearms Act. A record of this interview will be made and may be given in evidence if you are brought to trial. Do you understand the reason for your arrest? Yeah, that's fine. I understand. Okay, my name is Philip Bridge. I'm a detective constable stationed at police headquarters. Also in the room is Michael Brown, detective constable 744, also stationed at headquarters. Okay, Michael, if you could introduce yourself. Michael Scott Bowman. Okay, now I'm going to caution you now and say that you do not have to say anything. But it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you say may be given in evidence. Do you understand? Yes. Right, Michael, we had an interview earlier this morning and you asked us to stop whilst you sought legal advice. Are you quite happy that you've had enough time to take legal advice? Yeah, yeah, I've had some legal advice. This morning we had a discussion about your knowledge and relationship with three persons. That's Mr Tate. Mr. Tucker and Mr. Rolf, who were subsequently killed. Is that correct? Yes. At this stage, we don't wish to develop that any further, but we would like to do is to discuss with you the reason why you're here. And as we indicated this morning, the allegation is that you were responsible for supplying them with a firearm. Yeah. Okay, so you've had some time to think about what we said and what we spoke about earlier. Is there anything that you wish to add? Well, basically from what you're telling me, you knew that I met Craig in Forex Services. You told me that that's where I met him in the services, but that was the day that I sold the car. I met him over there to sell the car. I told you that earlier. I took the car around to the car front, 
Craig then gave me a lift back to Pat's house to see Tony. I think as it goes, I had a bit of a dispute about the check. He already had two cars out on bail with Pat. They bought a Merc and a Range Rover, if I remember rightly. Um, so I've been seen over that way on that day, and it's because of that. I went round there, discussed it. I mean, there was a couple of people pulling up when I was there. They seemed quite busy there. But I mean, that's all I can tell you. Okay, if we can just break that down, because obviously, you know, you've spilled it out to us, and that's because it's all going through your mind. Well, what I mean, well, what I'm trying to say is that this is the day that I sold the car. The reason that I was over there was because of that reason. I was selling the car. I got into the Range Rover at Fobbin. They took, um, well, he gave me a lift round to uh, Pat's house, I think it was. And his girlfriend was in the car. Donna. Is it Donna? His girlfriend? Craig Rolf's girlfriend? Yes, it is. She was crying on the telly. She was in the car. Um, I went round to the house. Uh, there was another fella there. I can't think of his name. He gave me a lift back. He had like a creamy coloured car. I think it was a Fiat or something. He gave me a lift back. Okay, what I want to do is, as I say, is to try and break that down because we want to contradict me. No, no, honestly, it's to break it down a little bit so that we can understand it in small chunks. Mm. Because as I say, you know you were there and it's a case that you've got it straight in your mind. What we need to do is to get it straight in our minds and anybody else. So if you just bear with me a little bit and try and help me along. Okay, as far as you can recall, when was it that this took place? I really can't remember the date. I can't remember the date exactly, but I think oh, I've been over there a couple of times. I've been to his house, well, probably about three times, Pat, I mean. But I mean, the day that I sold the car, I met Craig at Forex Services. Okay, right. If we just take the meeting at the Forex Services, right, you know what day that was because you're telling me that you've seen me there. But Mr. Bowman, I'm asking you as you know how it went down. I don't know what date it was though. Okay, so if we just deal with the Forex services. Mm -hmm. Right, what car were you in? I was in the Carada. Okay, were you on your own? Yeah. Was there any other person present? Um, Craig and his girlfriend? What sort of time did you meet them? <laughs> I really can't remember the time. I mean, this has gone on, it's over three and a half, four months ago now. I couldn't tell you the time. I know it was the daytime, it was daylight. Okay, was it morning or early morning? I think it was morning, not early morning, but I think it was 11-ish. I can't remember. Though. You can't remember? Well, I can't, no. I can't be specific. I'm just trying to put you into some sort of time, whether it's morning, lunchtime, afternoon, evening. I think it was sort of about dinner time. About dinner time, yeah. And you travelled from where? From Kent? From your home address, Michael? Yeah, yeah, in the Carada. To take it to the fella, but I wasn't sure where it was. So you met Craig? Craig? Because he runs about for them, doesn't he? Yeah? Okay, how did you arrange to meet Craig? Um, well, Tony said, I think, to be there at a specific, you know, specific time. And Craig would be there. He gave me Craig's number, I think, and I rung it. Was that a landline or a mobile number? I think it would have been a mobile. Right, so you turn up there. Mm -hmm. Did you know what vehicle to be looking for? Uh, the Range Rover. Okay, then correct me if I'm wrong. You'd been in, you told us earlier that you were in that Range Rover. Mm -hmm. Prior to that date? Yeah. Were Craig and his girlfriend waiting in the Range Rover? No. I think they was in the service station itself, but I got out and walked over and they come walking out. He seen me, then I followed them to Fobbin. Okay, was there anybody else present at the time? No. Any other vehicles? No. Did you consider about if you were going to sell the car that you may need a lift back? Yeah, I did, yeah. But they said they'd get me back there. Um, they had a friend of theirs over there, that way. So there's yourself in the Carada. Mm-hmm. Then there's Rolf and his girlfriend in the Range Rover. Yeah, yeah. You meet them about lunchtime. Mm-hmm. And where do you travel to? To Fobbin, the car front. Right, is that the... Near the Five Bells pub? You know, the one on the side. Okay. Would that be the Eastern Garages? I'm not really sure the name of the garage. Um, I really can't remember. Is it the garage? It's like a little car front by the roundabout. 
opposite on the opposite side. Okay, so you travel there and who leads the way? Craig led the way. What sort of speed were you doing? Well, I don't know. Was it a fast drive down there or a slow drive or... Well, I really don't know. I didn't tear down there. No? One last drive in the Corrada? No, no, it wasn't anything like that. You know, I got the car there. I don't know what time it was. He didn't give me the check straight away. Right, and if we just slow down there, Michael. So you're travelling in convoy. Yeah. Okay, and it goes to the eastern garages. Yeah. Where did the car stop? Where did you park? I parked it right up in the little road. There's like a little road, a um, bit right by where his cars are. I parked it in there. And where was the vehicle? In front of or behind the Range Rover? I can't remember. I was behind him, obviously. I was following him. Okay, so you've got two people in the Range Rover and yourself in the Corrada. Mm-hmm. What happens then? Well, I get in the Range Rover with Craig. What was that for? Because I'm going around to see Pat and Tony now. Okay. Um, had you done the deal with the, with the salesman? Well, I'll give the fella a check. He was half moaning because he said he didn't really want to buy it and he was doing me a favour, you know, the usual car spiel. So I said, well, I'll come back and get the check and I went around to see Pat because it's his friend. What were the rough circumstances of the deal at the garage then, Michael? Just go through that. Well, I don't think the fella wanted to part with the cash, to be honest. I mean, I don't think he wanted to buy any more cars, to be honest with you. That's what I thought at the time anyway, but, you know, we did the deal and then I went round to Pat's. So, did you negotiate it with him? That's the whole point that we're getting to. Yeah, well, yeah, he saw the car and he was going to take it. Right. He wasn't happy, he was sort of, um, you know, just unhappy about it, but I got in the car and we went round to see Pat and Tony at Pat's house. Right, now slowly, where were you sitting in the Range Rover? I can't, um, I think I got in the back. And who was in the front? His girlfriend was in the passenger seat and he was driving. So you then drove from there? Mm-hmm. And did your business at the garage take very long? No. I wasn't there very long. I was coming back to collect the cheque, I think, if I remember rightly. So you then drive to Pat's house. And what was the purpose of that? I wanted to see Pat and Tone. I mean, I was over that way. Okay, and what did you want to see them about? Well, I want to get a lift home. I want to get home. I can't get home. I've got no wheels to drive. Okay. And I've got to collect the cheque as well. You know, I want to get home. One of them's got to give me a lift. It ain't illegal to have friends and go and associate with people, is it? No, no, no one's saying it is. But what I'm trying to do is to try and work out as you're telling me. Well, it ain't hard to work that out, is it? I've just told you I sold the car. I've got no car to get home. I'm going round there to see them to get a lift home. There's nothing going on. No, but could I suggest to you that Craig could have taken you from there straight home? No, he never. He never. No, I'm not saying that he did. I'm just saying that wouldn't it have been quicker rather than going to see the other two? Well, I wanted to see Pat and Tone. That's fine, okay. He was over there. He's only been out of prison a little while, hasn't he? That's right, so you drive to whose house? To Pat's house, the little bungalow. Okay, and when you arrive there, mm -hmm, who's there? Um, the Black Merc was there. One of their mates pulled up, uh, had a creamy coloured saloon car. I don't know what it was. Might have been a Saab, I think. Saab 9000, something like that. Um, one of them sort of cars, anyway. I got out, went in there to see him. Did you know him? No, the other fella. No, I can't remember. I think his name was Tommy or something. Tom, Tom or something like that. Little fella. Went in the house. I said, he's half hooting about this check, Pat. Pat said, don't worry, I'll give him a call. Because I said to Pat, this fella's half moaning about not buying the car. He's rung him up, had a chat, like a chat of him. And then he said he'd go round and collect it on the way. The other fella will give you a lift home. I think it's Tommy, his name. Got a Saab or a Fiat, creamy colour Fiat. I come out and got in the car with him. And what's he look like then, Michael? Oh, only short, little fella. Yeah. Age? Well, about 28. Young fella. I think one of their runabouts again. So who's in the bungalow when you arrive? Uh, well, the Merc was there. I think Tony was there as well because he had, uh, well, there was another couple of guys. There was Tony and his old woman was taking their stuff out of the house. Patrick's old woman was leaving the house. She had loads of bags. She was taking all her stuff from the loft. Pat was lobbing her out. That's when I started to see their true colours, really. He was taking her stuff out of the house, all her clothes. Um, I think it might have been her dad or her mum was there as well. So she was in the process of moving out. She's taking her stuff out, yeah. You know what it's like when you've got all that sort of stuff going on. I mean, I was only there probably five or ten minutes, top whack. 
I come out of there with a little guy who gave me a lift down to the garage to collect the cheque, then back home to Ken. So you collected the cheque from, from the garage at Fobbin. And then he dropped me back through. I went back through the Dartford Tunnel and got me home. That was Tommy. Yeah, all the way home, all the way. Now you've had time to think about it, Michael. Can you remember the guy's name that you dealt with at the garage? Uh, well, I know it's the governor at a car front. Um, I seem to remember Tony saying that they took the Merc and the Range Rover off them. So, and I think they owed the money for the cars. So when I've gone over there to sell the Carada, he was a little bit funny about the money. You know, but then Pat's rung up and it was all sorted out. Okay now, Mr. Bowman. Now, what I'm saying to you is that your account ties up around 95%, which is almost all of the account that we have. But there are some main areas where I'm suggesting to you that you haven't been totally truthful. Oh, well, I gathered it was going to be that way. No, but in all fairness to you, all I wanted to do was put some of those areas to you that we consider that you are either mistaken or possibly forgotten about, or that possibly that you don't want to tell us about for whatever reason. That's fair, isn't it? Well, I'm all ears. Okay, so when you arrived, and only you will know whether I'm telling the truth or not, mm, okay, when you arrived at Forex Services, mm, it was to meet Mr. Rolf and his girlfriend. Yeah, in the Range Rover. What I'm putting to you is that there was another person travelling with you in another vehicle. What do you mean? That you know there's another person in the car with me? No, in another car, another vehicle. So there's three cars there. There were three cars, hear me out. There was the Range Rover, yeah. There was your white Corrada, mm. And there was another vehicle, right. And what I'm suggesting to you is that other vehicle was a Vauxhall Cavalier. <laughs> no, you're mistaken, mate, you're wrong. I've just told you what's going on, right? That's all I can tell you. Well, we've got to put what we've got to you. I know what you've got to say. Look, listen, listen. Okay. As I say, these are the areas that we are not really touching on, on at the moment. And it's only right that I put them to you. Well, you've got to go through it. Right. There is a Vauxhall Cavalier. Hmm. With you. No. No way. Okay. And that in the Vauxhall Cavalier was a holdall. Right. And that holdall contained a firearm. Right. And the reason that Vauxhall Cavalier contained the firearm was because you were going to the meet and didn't want to run the risk of being stopped with a firearm on board. No, you're mistaken completely. This is completely wrong. At the Furrock services. Mm. You met Rolf and you, what you say is correct. You then travelled in convoy with Rolf driving the Range Rover in the lead, the Cavalier in the second position, and you at the back in your white Carada. And you travelled, as you quite rightly say, to the Eastern Garages to the Five Bells Roundabout Garage. What I'm also putting to you is that when you arrived at the garage, you parked, as you said, in that access road, right? Mm. In the order that you travelled there in convoy, you then removed a holdall from the Cavalier and placed it into the back of the Range Rover. Mm. What do you say to that? It's wrong. But what I'd like to do is show you the holdall so there's obviously no mistake about it, Michael, what we're talking about. What you're saying is, I carry the hold all. I'm asking you, I'm not telling you, I'm asking you what you did and what you did there. Well, you're telling me, aren't you? That I'm 5% wrong in what I've already told you, 95% of it's the truth. What I'm saying is, you're telling me that you've seen me with a bag. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm trying to give you the opportunity to tell me. You don't have to give me no opportunities. I've told you exactly what's gone on here. Okay. Right, hold on a second, Michael. Just have a look at this bag. That's the bag that we're saying that you had. A black and green bag. Well, look, I think that because you can obviously see the one that I'm referring to for the tape, it's exhibit GF slash six, which is a hold all bag. Now this bag has been obviously treated for fingerprints. All right, yeah. Which accounts for part of the discoloration on the bag. As far as we can see that is, I'll get out the bag, but it is a bit messy. Right. Okay, Michael, have you seen that bag before? Well, it's a sports bag, isn't it? I've seen loads of bags. Can't say I've seen that one. Well, no, that's why I'm asking you, Michael. Have you seen that bag before? Well, I can't say I've seen that bag before, no. No. So you haven't, right, okay. Because that's the bag that we're talking about, that we believe that the gun, the machine pistol, whatever you want to call it, that we'll show you a photograph of in a moment, that that was in this bag. Look, I can't tell you nothing about the bag. Right, well, what we're putting to you, there's loads of sports bags about. 
They're everywhere. Fair enough, but what we're putting to you, I go to the gym three, four times a week. I've got about four different sports bags that I take to the gym. But we're not saying that, Michael. What we're saying, but I'm just saying, I know what you're saying. We're referring specifically to that. I can't say that I've seen that bag before. No. Right, okay, Michael. What we're putting to you is that this was the bag that was in the back of the Vauxhall Cavalier. In the back of the Vauxhall Cavalier. Right, okay. Yeah, so you understand that, Michael, don't you? I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so you're saying that you've never seen that bag before. No, I can't recall seeing the bag there. Okay, now what I'm going to show you now is a picture of the pistol. So obviously the tape can't see this. So I'm now showing you a picture of the what we are referring to as the machine pistol. What you're saying, I supplied them with that. Hang on, just let me finish, please. This consists of the main basic body of the weapon, the moderator, as they call it, or the silencer. It has a magazine clip here with a cartridge in it or a shell in it and a quantity of shells around the bottom. I mean, obviously, if you wish to know the exact quantities here, I can tell you. But so that's the photograph. So that is the bag that we're saying contains that weapon that you have supplied to them on that date at the garage. No way. Have you ever seen this weapon before? I've never seen that before, no. It's amazing I've supplied that to three people who've been assassinated. Have I? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Basically, I've supplied that to three people who've been assassinated. That's right. Okay. And as I say, Michael, we believe that that weapon arrived in the Vauxhall Cavalier, and that was with yourself and a person who was acting as the gopher. Right. That was then taken, as I say, to the Eastern Garage. Well, what colour was the Cavalier? What colour are you saying this Cavalier is? Why, is that some problem? Well, no. I said to you earlier there was a car outside the house when I pulled up. The fella gave me a lift home. It was a creamy coloured sort of fear or Saab. Would it help you if you knew what colour it was? Is this just a little test to see if we do know, Michael? No, I'm just saying, you know. Is it? I mean, if it's time to put the cards on the table, then it will be. If it's a testing question to find out. No, there's no question. There's no testing. There's no testing the questions at all in this interview. Right, Michael. The one that was there wasn't a creamy colour. The one that we're suggesting travelled in convoy. Well, well, no, I don't know what cavalry you're talking about then. Okay, when you got to the garage, what we're putting to you is that you got into the Range Rover, as you told us. Mm. But also put into the Range Rover was that bag, together with that weapon and ammunition that you've seen in the photograph. Well, I did not see that, because I went in to see the geezer about the car. I don't know what you're talking about. I really don't. I got out. I went to see the fella about the car. He had a little look at the motor. That's all I can tell you. I did not see no bag going in the Range Rover. I did not see no Cavalier. So, no, I can't help you. I really can't. I really can't help you. Okay, Michael. Now, why do you think, or perhaps you do know or don't know, why do you think that someone should implicate you with this illegal firearm? What you mean, what's my opinion of why they put it on me? I really don't know. Well, it's quite a serious thing, though, isn't it? Well, I mean, yeah, but for all I know, you might just be saying this. You might not have any information at all. Then again, you might have, but... What I'm trying to say to you is, I'm not responsible. Right, Michael. For supplying that firearm to those three people who are now dead. Fine, okay, right, Michael. Let me just say that we have a statement from a person who isn't a police officer. Right. Containing the information that we have given to you. But I can't understand why they'd say that. Look, just let me finish. I'm answering your question now to obviously allay your suspicion. Hmm. That we're either trying to trick you or it's a police ploy that we, you know, we're actually in possession of that statement. That doesn't make me feel like you're, that this is the truth, that that person is obviously lying. So they're lying about the meeting at the Forex Services as well. Well, I'm not. No, because I haven't denied that. I've told you that I met them there. Yeah, I, I can't understand why they're saying I actually give them that thing. I never give them that. Certainly, Michael, because as far as this offence goes, that's fairly innocuous, isn't it? You know, like the circumstances of the meeting in relation to handing over that weapon. Well, I don't, I don't know now exactly what's going on. As far as I'm concerned, really, uh, you know, my solicitor's here. I've asked him to be here. I really can't help you no more. I've told you everything I possibly can about what I've remembered. Um, I certainly don't, well, I most certainly didn't supply them with a machine gun, even though there's a machine gun that you've just showed me. 
and one way or another I don't really want to answer any more questions because I feel like I've explained everything I can up to this point and you know in all honesty we're going around in circles now no we're not going around in circles well I mean you're basically calling me a liar you're saying that someone's written a statement against me no Michael what we're saying to you and I don't really want to answer any more questions to be honest Look, Michael, we have a duty to investigate this offence and we just want you to tell the truth. I've told you everything. Well, I've told you everything. I can't tell you no more. I can't tell you anymore. What I've told you is what I know went on. I did not supply them with a machine gun. I went over there, sold my car and I came home. That's it. I'm not going to answer any more questions at this stage. Is that all right? Can I do that? That's fine. My client has requested to answer no further questions. He is quite within his right to do so. Okay, Michael, that's fine. No one's trying to make you say anything you don't want to say. But as we've pointed out to you, we obviously have information. This ain't got nothing to do with my previous convictions at all, has it? It hasn't entered into your head for one moment that I've got firearms on my phone, then coming round my way this morning, dragging me out of bed in my underpants and things like that because of my previous convictions. Right, to answer that, Michael, that as your solicitor will tell you and explain that we're involved in quite a large inquiry. Oh, I know you are. And we are. I really understand that. I said that to you earlier. Right, Michael, okay. I appreciate that you've got to go through every angle to find out who killed these three people because whoever, you know, is a terrible, naughty person. The fella's dangerous. I understand that. But what I'm trying to say to you is you can't go around these circles trying to stick things on me. We haven't done that, Michael. Or someone has, you know, put it on me that I supplied them with that because, you know, their old man's dead or whatever, right? Okay, Michael, now before we conclude this interview, when we spoke to you originally, we asked you about your relationship with Tucker, Tate and Rolf. Yeah, well, I'm not going to answer no more questions at this stage, okay? But you can listen. When you originally told us, you said you were trying to distance yourself. I believe uh, you said it wasn't a very deep relationship. It was just that you met them a few times. That's what you told us originally, and I'd be interested to know when the last time you actually spoke to any of them was. This has nothing to do with a gun, has it? All right, look, that's what I'm trying to say to you. I've answered the questions about myself. I don't really want to start asking or answering any more questions about anyone else. I spoke to Pat the day before, the day before it happened. They've rung me a couple of times. They always ring me a couple of times a week, but that's it now, no more. Did you leave a message on their answer phone? No comment. If you'd like to learn more about the Range Rover murders as told in court, then please click on the video in front of you now. You'll also see the Essex Boys playlist, which has an array of separate videos regarding this case in one convenient folder. Many thanks for joining me for this video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.